Like I said, I've spent a lot of time in, in this gospel, in the gospel of John. The first book I read personally uh, in the New Testament was the book of Matthew, like a lot of us, just because that's the first book in the New Testament. You start off Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But I discovered what a valuable tool, how important it is for young believers, John is, the gospel of John. And so, so we often counsel brand new believers or people that are just beginning their relationship with Jesus to get to know, to get to know Jesus through the gospel of, of John because John presents Jesus in such a unique way. But let me take you back to a question that Solomon, King Solomon, asked when he built that temple in Jerusalem. And he was dedicating it and praying before the Lord. And, you know, he said, it's been a lifelong dream of my father, King David. And here it is. He was so proud that he finally had finished that temple. And he said, and your glory has filled this place. And we want you, O God, to dwell among your people. But then he asked a question, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? It's, it's like, wait a minute, Solomon's stopping and he's pausing and he's thinking, the heavens can even contain God, much less this temple that I have built. Will God indeed dwell here on earth? So it's a good question and, and he's thinking, I mean, heaven is so, is so awesome and that's even too small to contain God. How in the world will we be able to keep him or, or have him here in this temple? And, and so I, I know God dwelled among his people there in the tabernacle. That was his plan. His plan was, uh, always think of it this way. Why was it that, that God wanted them to worship him in a temple uh, or, or specifically in a tabernacle, in a tent? Because these people had been slaves for 400 years. He was trying to teach them to have a very close intimate relationship with God. He was trying to teach them worship, reverence, and so he wanted them to know that he was with them, amongst them. And so he told them, I want you to build a tent for me. Not, not a building that will stay there forever, but a tent that will uh, be movable. So when you move from, from around the desert in the wilderness, I will move with you. And so that was his plan. King David had a greater plan in his mind. He thought he wanted a, a building. He wanted a temple. King Solomon finished it. And so he, he knew that, King Solomon knew that, yes, his Holy Spirit or, or the presence of God would be there with them. And that uh, the Bible tells us that, that his presence was there on the mercy seat, what is called the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, to us, we simply see a box with with symbolic angels over the box and 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 that was the ark of the covenant the what represented uh the very presence of god now it stood there the temple did once they built it the people gathered to worship there god did amazing works and wonders there in the midst of his people but you also remember at, as the worship system of the tabernacle and temple wore on as they started to worship even other gods and as the worship that was happening in the temple was now just religious and it was just routine and it wasn't real anymore. Uh, the glory of God, the presence of God departed. It left the temple literally. Ezekiel, when we started the book of Ezekiel, he says that he saw the glory of God depart. Now, to describe it in human terms, it's difficult, but Ezekiel simply says that he saw like a cloud uh, uh, elevate from the temple and that he saw the cloud uh, uh, simply go what it would be westward like out into the ocean separating himself from Israel and so so he he saw the presence of the Lord vanish from Israel leave Israel and so back to the question will God indeed dwell on earth well can he actually be here on earth now we come to the gospel of John tonight in the first chapter, in the 14th verse, John says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and He lived there among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as the one and only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The, the Eugene Peterson, Pastor Eugene Peterson translation, we call it the message version, 
Uh, he simply says, and Jesus, God moved into the neighborhood, that he dwelled among us, that he was here. So God became a human. Now, John was one of the witnesses to that. He saw God in the flesh. And John gives us the, the, what we would say the fullest account that exalts the godliness or the, or the deity uh, that Jesus was, was God himself and the glory of Jesus like none other gospels do. And so last week we saw Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But John is so unique. And this is simply referred to as the fourth gospel. People say, okay, there's the three gospels. There's so much alike in the three of them. But then there's this fourth gospel. This one is unique because John, being one of the youngest disciples, if not the youngest, he was able to have a lot more, a lot longer time also. Uh, John was the only one that simply died of old age compared to the others that were martyred much younger. And so, so John had a much longer time to be able to, to uh, bring in all these thoughts and explain uh, Jesus, not just the facts, but it was truly a sermon that John was able to teach the, the theology, the, the, the explanation of who Jesus is, 100% God, 100% man. And so, so uh, I'll explain all this in a moment, but now, now I'm going to take you way back, way back again. Uh, back to the wilderness, as I was saying, back where they would have the tabernacle, when, when God was dwelling or living there among his people in the tabernacle. So the, the book of Numbers, the, the tribes were encamped in, in the book of Numbers, it says in chapter 2, at the foot of Mount Sinai, where Moses received the, the commandments from God. And, and so they were divided into four sections. This image is, is, a, is a beautiful, perfect uh, uh, just illustration of how the book of Numbers describes. So if you ever, if you ever try to, you know, if you're reading the, the, the whole Old Testament and you get to the book of Numbers and you start thinking, what in the world, God, why do you want me to know this? Here you go. This is, this is still important. It might be just numbers and a lot of counting. It literally is a census. Um, it, literally, it literally was a survey of counting how many Israelites were there and how many were part of what, which tribe. And, and God wanted them to divide in a certain way into families. And so it says that they were in, divided into four sections, depending on the four sides or signs uh, or directions that we still talk about. The north, the south, the east, the west. And, and so this is how it would look from, from up top. But just to zoom in, just to understand a little bit more, these were the, the three tribes on each side, making the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons of, of, of uh, Jacob. And so on the east side, there was the three tribes. On the west side, there was three tribes. On the south and north, there were three tribes. The 12 tribes divided into four groups of four, with three tribes per camp, per group. In each of those four directions, those uh, four large camps of three tribes, they all gather, gathered under the tribal banner or the standard of one tribe. And so they all had different banners that represented who they were. And so the largest tribe, they went by their name. So you have the tribe of Dan, the tribe of Ephraim, the tribe of Judah, and the tribe of Reuben. And so, uh, uh, and then the smaller tribes or the smaller families gathered under them. And so um, tradition gives us gives to us the Jewish tradition what the signs of those banners or ensigns or logos we would think of it more of as a logo those standards were so for example uh, facing the east was the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Judah had a very special emblem uh, a flag a banner that was a lion on the west side was the tribe of Ephraim and the tribe of Ephraim, the three groups that gathered under that banner of the tribe of Ephraim, or the, or the group of Ephraim, was an ox. So we have the, the lion, we have the ox. So you have a lion on one side, an ox on the other. And then on the north and the south, there were three tribes, and three tribes under the banner, and another banner. And on one side was the tribe of Reuben, and he had the banner of a man. And the other tribe was the tribe of Dan. And Dan had a banner uh, or an insignia or a logo of an eagle. So you have a lion, an ox, a man, and an eagle. And so that's the tabernacle. This is, this is again how 
uh, uh, they kind of separated themselves. God wanted them to be separate, uh, uh, organized, and then they were organized by this symbol. So they were proud of being part of the tribe that was represented by a lion, the other one by a man or an ox or an eagle. And so now let me just throw in something else. If you were to look at the tabernacle, like I said, from up top, uh, like a drone, from an aerial view, you're looking down. If the tribe of Judah was at the bottom, that would have been the largest encampment. Judah had the most family. And there were more people in that eastern encampment that had Judah up at the top. And so you would see more people in the tribe of Judah. Uh, fewer people in the encampment of Ephraim and just about equal amounts on two sides, on the north and the south. And so looking at it from the, from the aerial view or a, or a drone shot, it would appear to you like, like a cross, right? It, it's like, uh, it's almost, what a huge coincidence. Was it just a coincidence or was God trying to tell us something? Uh, uh, the way that, that it was separate, it was, it was and just again, the, t the top was smaller, the bottom was much larger, and so like a cross. And, and so the top part would, would be a little bit smaller and equal distance on the side. Now, the tabernacle right in the center of all the families, of all the tribes, the place of God dwelling with his people was, you might say, the model of the throne of God. That that is where you would go and, and experience the presence of God. And remember, only the priest could do this. Now, fast forward to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel sees a vision of the glory of God, and he sees these creatures in Ezekiel in chapter 1 and chapter 10. And so he sees this creature, uh, and, and in Ezekiel 1, these four creatures each had a face of a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. And so hold that thought. So there is this, this human. Uh, now it's got this human body, but it, for, uh, the head itself has four faces. This is a vision that Ezekiel was having. And so go to the book of Revelation in chapter 4, and John, the same John that uh, wrote this gospel, he sees a vision of four living creatures with eyes in front and behind. And one had the appearance of a lion, one had the appearance of a man, one had the appearance of an ox, and one had the appearance of an eagle. So again, I don't think it's all coincidental. I don't think that it's all just all of a sudden, oh, it's just different images, no. Different visions, no. It's all connected. It seems like... It's all the fingerprints of the Holy Spirit throughout Scripture, from, from the book of Numbers, from, from, even from Genesis, all the way to Revelation. And add that to the four Gospels. So again, why four Gospels? Well, it's interesting. We discovered last week, Matthew shows Jesus as fulfilling all the Scriptures. He is the king that they were waiting for, the king of the Jews, the fulfillment of Jewish anticipating a king, a Messiah, the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's what they would call the king that they were expecting. And Mark, he pictures Jesus just in this fast place, fast pace like a movie, going very rapidly. Remember Mark, the way he wrote, he was saying, and then this happened, immediately this happened. He is the servant of the Lord. That's how Mark wants to describe Jesus. He was a servant. The ox was considered in the Old Testament described as the beast of burden or the servant animal. So the ox represents Mark. Then you have the Gospel of Luke picturing Jesus as the Son of Man, the perfect ideal man. That's how Luke wanted to describe Jesus to the Greeks that were looking for the perfect man. And he says, let me, let me present to you Jesus. And so he has that, that symbol of a man. Now you have the Gospel of John, and this pictures Jesus soaring like the eagle as the great Son of God, or God in human flesh. So again, I don't think it's coincidental. I think it's there so we get the idea that there's a full picture of Christ. What's so awesome also is that to enter into the tabernacle, to enter into the presence of God, the only way to enter was through the front side, which was through the tribe of Judah. And so literally, that's true. You, that's where the gate was to enter into the tent through the tribe of Judah. But think of it this way, that to get to the presence of God, to get to the throne of God, to get to heaven, who do we go through? Through the tribe of Judah, and the descendant of Judah is Jesus. 
And so you, to get to the throne room of God, the very presence of God or heaven itself, he is the way, the truth, and the light. He is, he is the way for us to enter. Again, coincidence, probably not. Holy Spirit working in the, all of Scripture, connecting all of this together. And so, okay, so we talked last week, those three first Gospels. We call them the synoptic Gospels. And we covered that last week. Matthew, we said, and Luke were like two like snapshots. Like this is who Jesus is, uh, of Jesus' life. The Gospel of Mark was a very fast-paced movie. The Gospel of John is more like a studied painting. It's like, uh, uh, let me describe to you, says John. And, 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 and uh, not so much that, that it's overwhelming. Luke, when you read Luke, it's, it's one story after another, different parables, different teachings, a lot. John is able to say all that in only 21 chapters, but he, he's focused and he's saying, these images I'm giving you, this is how you're going to find out who Jesus is. Now, it is very different from the other Gospels. Let me explain why. Over 90% of, of John's Gospel is unique only to, to John. The other three Gospels don't even bring it up. It's the strongest evidence for the, again, the deity, the, the, the godliness of who of that, that Jesus is not just a man, that Jesus is not just a servant, that Jesus is not just the descendant of, of David and he's the king, that he's not the son of a carpenter, but that Jesus is actually God himself. So in the book of John, the seven, he gives us the seven I am statements. These, these statements where Jesus says, I am, I am, I am. Just a, just a good little fact for you, when the atheists come at you and tell you this, atheists will always tell you, you know that Jesus never said it throughout, in any part of the Gospels, that he is the Son of God. And literally, no, he didn't. And so, so you, they, you, you know, we would say, yeah, uh, I, I'm glad that they know their Bible. Because, yes, literally, Jesus actually never said, uh, uh, I am the Son of God. But... He said he, he didn't say it specifically because, again, all of this is based on, on, on faith. And so he, even if he would have said it directly, he would have, they would have killed him on the spot. But every time they would ask him, are you the son of God? He would say things like, before Abraham, I am. So he wasn't even saying, uh, yes, I am or anything. He would say before Abraham, because Abraham is their father of their faith. Abraham is, is uh, God chose Abraham and from him, all the rest of the tribes and families in Israel came from that. And so Abraham is, is at the top level. And Jesus says, before Abraham, I am. Now, remember when Moses was out in the desert and, and the presence of God shows up to Moses from a bush and he begins to speak and Moses says, well, who, do, who, who do I tell Pharaoh is sending me? And God says, just tell him I am is sending you. And so Jesus, almost, you know, a little bit, not sarcastically, but almost kind of with winking his eye, he says, I am. So he doesn't only say it one time. He says it seven times, according to John. And so, so John chooses these I am statements to make sure that who's ever reading Right away, they recognize he's talking about himself as God, comparing himself to that very same God we read throughout the Old Testament. And also, John is choosing seven specific, not miracles, he doesn't call them miracles, he calls them signs. Because a sign leads you to, it, it points you towards something. Uh, so, so, so John, he's not just interested in talking about, wow, the miracles of Jesus as if they're just some kind of trick, magic trick or something. Jesus did some, some amazing things and then we applaud. No, John shows seven specific signs and he's saying because this happened, this is pointing us and explaining to us who Jesus is. And so, again, these moments are also that Jesus, he's explaining himself through John who he is, completely man, completely God. And so there's no parables in, in the Gospel of John. And again, the miracles that are recorded, there's, there's not many of them. There's only seven. Uh, and five of those seven are unique, again, to John. The other Gospels don't talk about them. And only two are shared with, with the other Gospels. And, the, and also, in the book of John, it's the longest prayer in the New Testament. That's found there in the book of John. And it's Jesus' own prayer in John chapter 17, uh, the longest prayer. But there's also 
the shortest verse in the Gospel of John. The shortest verse is in chapter 11. There outside of, of Lazarus' tomb, you know it, Jesus gets to Lazarus, he knows he's, he has already died, and then two words, Jesus wept. The shortest verse in the Bible. And so one-third of the whole Gospel of John, if you just think about it, those 21 chapters, one-third of it covers just the last eight days of Jesus' life, from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday. And also, the most famous verse in all of Scripture, the most often quoted verse in all of Scripture, uh, shows up everywhere, even at sporting events, political rallies. I mean, it's, it's uh, most people that have no idea what the rest of the Bible says, they know John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. Something else in the Gospel of John, the word Jesus and the word Christ, they, they are found so many times within, within the, the Gospel. There is... There, and, and so not only the word Jesus and Christ is repeated over and over, uh, but it's 170 times throughout the gospel. Now, the book is not about John. In fact, he's not even mentioned. He doesn't even mention his own name in, in, the, in the book as, as, as the author of the book. Uh, I'll explain that in a second. But it's all about Jesus. He wants us as the reader to understand this book is not about me. It's not an autobiography. It's not a biography. This is all about Jesus, 170 times. Not only that, but the word believe is, is a key word in this book. The word believe shows up 98 times in the Gospel of John. So if you want to know what the book of John is about, you count the words that are used over and over and over, and so it's believe, 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 Jesus, 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 Christ, Christ, Christ. And he tells us in John chapter 20, at the end, he says, truly more signs than these Jesus did in the presence of his disciples. So John is saying, there's so many more signs, more miracles, more stories, which are not recorded in this book, says, says John. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is, is the Christ, the chosen one, the anointed one of God, and by believing have life in his name. He gives us the purpose. Very few books in the Bible do that. Most books in the Bible, they just, they just kind of start and end, and then you kind of understand what the main point is. Not John. He, he gives us the purpose. He says this is what it's about. Now, if you know somebody that, that you've shared the gospel with and uh, you've, you've told them about Jesus or you told them that you're going to church and you invited them to church and they're still struggling with Christianity and with God and belief and you've shared and they've, they've already kind of tuned you out, uh, just give them a little printed copy. They, they have them. We have them. Just a little copy of, of the Gospel of John. This just, just that's it. Those 21 chapters. And, and I've watched the Gospel of John confront people like nothing else and they go from atheists to fully born again believers because because they meet Jesus through these 21 chapters now John his dad so let's get to know know John so John his dad was named Zebedee so the Bible says his brother was named James so James and John were sons of Zebedee and they were both disciples they had a fishing business in the Sea of Galilee they were also partners with two other brothers, Peter and Andrew, all four of them becoming disciples. Now, and, and so you will see Peter and James and John, those specific three, not so much Andrew, but Peter, James, and John, as part of what we call the inner circle with Jesus. The, the, so there's the 12, but then Jesus had his three. The, the, the specific, not that they were his favorite or anything, but he was able to work deeper with those three. And so... Uh, uh, now, you'll see there's these certain events uh, throughout the gospel that the other disciples are not part of. Like, the, for example, there's something called the transfiguration of Jesus. Jesus takes uh, John, James, and Peter up a hill, up a mountain, and he's up there praying, and all of a sudden, um, they hear the voice of God, they see, they see literally Moses, they see literally Elijah there, and so it's this, it's this miraculous moment, and, and so they get to experience that. Uh, there's also a moment where uh, there's the raising of, of a little girl. She's the daughter of a man named Jairus, uh, where 
uh, Jesus gets there. there. Everybody is crying. Everybody is already saying, oh, why would this young girl die? And it's, and, it's, and it's a terrible moment. Lots of unbelief. Jesus tells everybody to leave. He says, get out the house. Get out this room. She's not dead. She's just sleeping. They all thought he was crazy because she stopped breathing. She stopped, her, her heart was, was, was stopped beating. And, but Jesus, he wanted all the unbelief to get out. And he tells Peter, James, and John to come in with him, to pray with him. They pray. She comes back to life, and she wanted to eat. And so, um, and, and so now this, again, these, these right here are part of the inner circle of, of Jesus. So is John, the one we're going to be reading from. So, okay, his name, again, like I said, does not appear in any part of the gospel. We believe John wrote it, even though John didn't say, I'm John, I wrote it. He does that in Revelation. Uh, so don't get confused. I've had people ask me before. Now, who are you talking about, Pastor? What, is that John the Baptist? No. So there's John the Baptist. Or we're going to say John the B. And then there's John the A, John the Apostle. This is who John the Apostle or John the Disciple is, okay? And he's the same one that wrote John the, the Gospel of John. First, second, and third, John. We call those epistles or letters. And then he wrote Revelation, same John, same John. Then there's John the Baptist. He never wrote a book. He simply preached out in the desert and baptized and baptized Jesus. And so, so just, just know that. So he wrote Revelation. In Revelation, he did say, I am John who wrote this. And he says, I saw that. Uh, uh, here he does, he does not say that. He says, he doesn't say, I, John. He simply uh, refers himself as the disciple who Jesus loved. And so I bring that up because if you're thinking, wow, wow, John is, didn't want to mention his name because he's so humble. Because, uh, um, as most Johns are, right? They're so humble. And, and, and so they, he's, you probably think that I thought that at first. I thought, well, wow, you read a whole gospel about, about Jesus and you don't even include your own name in there. He talks about Peter, he talks about James, he talks about the other disciples, but he never mentions his own name. But he's the guy who said, I'm the disciple who Jesus loved. And, and so enough said with that. I don't know how, how humble that is, but it's true. He was the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, probably because, again, John, at the time when he became a disciple, he was, think about this, he was, uh, some historians say he was about 15 years old. So he was a young teenager. And so left his dad from being a fisherman, Zebedee, to follow Jesus and now he's there with Jesus. And, and so uh, as, a, as, as a rabbi or teacher that Jesus was, he took care of his disciples, but he knew he had to take care a little bit extra of the young kid, of, of little John. And so he took care of him, protected him, and loved him. And so that's why John would say of himself, I'm the one that he loved the most, because he was the youngest. He was the baby, as most babies in, in families get, get a little bit more love. And, and so uh, this is who John is, okay? So think about that, that he was, he was young when he was seeing all this happen. But by the time he writes this, he's probably already in his, in his 60s, if not 70s. By the time he writes Revelation, he's already in his 80s. And, and so that's in his, in his later uh, years of life. But everything that we, we hear about when, with Jesus, it's either in his teenage years or early 20s. And so, uh, but, but I like how he personalizes it, though. I'm the one that Jesus loved. Now, you're going to hear some weird things throughout your Christian life about John. Uh, there's some uh, people that say, oh, he's the one that was loved by Jesus. Oh, they had a relationship. Yeah, they'll say things like that. There's also uh, uh, the moment where, where it says that Jesus uh, had such an intimate relationship with John. Again, he's younger, uh, that, that John would put his head on Jesus' chest. Again, Jesus is like a spiritual father to all of them. Uh, Jesus is, is the, the teacher, the rabbi, and Jesus is God. And so, so the young teenager, the young man named John is, is trusting Jesus and, and having this very close relationship with him. And, and so today, there's a lot of, of atheists or uh, a lot of uh, secular historians that would say, oh, see, Jesus and John had a romantic relationship with one another. 
So I just want to mention that to you to explain to you, no. So whenever someone brings that up to you or you're watching some, some documentary or something about how, how that is one of the reasons why uh, there are some that say that as Christians they could still have uh, relationships between uh, a man and a man, a woman and a woman. And so one of the reasons is why they say, well, see, Jesus and John had a relationship, so we can too. Well, uh, they just don't have their history correct. But again, so let's see why we know that John was the, the author of this. Um, again, so he never describes the, the, the himself as, the, as John, but the things that he describes, only Peter James and John could have known. And so John is there, number one. Number two, uh, why we know it's John, the Greek, uh, the, the, the language, the way he, he writes Greek, uh, it's very simple. It's, it's kind of like you would say, like I'm trying to speak English right now, just in a simple way, not, not educated, not, not some kind of, you know, not use big words, uh, or not use the King James language but simply in a very simple way. And John was trying to do that because John was, wasn't writing so much to Jewish people or to the intellectual philosophers, the, the Greeks, but he was just writing to the whole world, to anybody that would listen, to anybody that w wanted to understand. And so, so he's, he's writing to them. And so he's writing to them, making sure that, that they're able to understand it in a much easier way. And, and so he writes it in a very simple, simple Greek um, another reason is that uh, another third historical clue why we know it was the same John, there was a guy named Irenaeus, okay? Irenaeus was a disciple of a guy named Polycarp. And so by, by the time I'm talking about now, it's about almost 100 years after Jesus died and resurrected, almost uh, about 50 years after John had already passed away. And so, so there was a disciple named Polycarp, and then he had another disciple named Irenaeus. Now, John had told Polycarp that he did write the fourth gospel, and Polycarp told his disciple, Irenaeus, he wrote the fourth gospel. So Irenaeus, he wrote it down, so that's pretty early. Almost an eyewitness account that John wrote the gospel. So John is the most theological of all the authors, as, as seen here in the first chapter of First John, uh, the first chapter of John the Gospel, of the Gospel of John. And so we begin there. Let's go again to John chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 1 and a couple verses. Let, let, me, let me set this up by saying, Matthew began with Abraham. He started right at the beginning. The, the, the genealogy, remember, is, that's how Matthew begins talking about the family, connecting Jesus all the way back to Abraham. And so because he's, he's trying to attract the Jewish audience, he's trying to see, tell the Jews, this is who you've been waiting for. So Abraham, the father. Now Mark, he includes no ge genealogy. He doesn't talk about families. He's writing about a servant. He wants to, to explain to, to even the, the people that always, the outcasts, the people that never felt like they were part of, of royalty or anything special. And so Mark writes to them and he says, no, Jesus is, is just like us. He's a servant. He came to serve us. Uh, and so Luke, he, but, so he doesn't include a genealogy. Uh, a servant doesn't need one. But Luke, he does go back to write a genealogy, a family tree. He goes all the way back to Adam. So he goes all the way back to the beginning. But John beats them all. He goes back before Adam. So the book begins with the incarnation of the Son of God. He goes to chapter 1. He says, in the beginning was the Word. He goes all the way back to the beginning before Adam was even created. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. Now you understand why we call ourselves the Word Church. And so it's not just the Word, the Bible, the Word. Uh, people say that all the time. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, praise the Lord. Amen, the Bible. No, no, the Word, Jesus. So we're basically the Jesus Church. And so the Word Church, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. So... As you read that first verse, that's, that sort of sounds like a strange way to introduce a person in such an impersonal way. You might think that's, well, I don't, I don't get it. In the beginning was the Word. The Word? What, what, what was that? What, what does that mean, the Word? 
So the ancient Hebrews, or the ancient Jewish people, in some of their writings would use the, the Hebrew word memra. Memra means word, memra. And they would use it in that place of the name of God. So instead of using the, the name Yahweh, or in English for us it's I am, or, or El Shaddai, instead of, saying, instead of using words like uh, Lord, like the Old Testament does in Hebrew, they, they switched it to the word. And so they would use that word. And they would use that in place of the name God, in place of the name the Lord. And also, the Greeks, they used a term called logos or logos. It's, it's spelled out logos, but it's pronounced logos. The Greek people, the secular Greek people, they had no idea who Jesus was, but they loved talking about the logos. And, and you see, the Greeks, they studied their world. They were big on, on trying to figure out how the world existed. And, and so they, they studied all that, and they saw that in the world, there was this, this predictability, this, there was these patterns, uh, there was seasons, uh, there's predictable, the sunrise, the sunset, there's an order to nature. We know like everything, as soon as, as, soon as winter ends, there's spring, spring ends, there's, there's, there's the, the summer, then there's the, the fall. And, 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 and they see all that. And so they, they were like, there's this predictability. But what's behind all that organization? Behind that organization, they called it, there is this logos, there is this logos, there is this, this uh, uh, organizer, the one that organized it all. So that's what they would call it. That's the word they used. Were you going to ask a question? Okay. And so, and, and they call that the logos. And so John, so again, with, with this Jewish understanding but but more a greek mind understanding as a greek he says in the beginning was the logos the word in literally in greek he uses their secular word to describe the organizer of the world logos and he says the logos was in the beginning was the word with god and the word was god and so he's basically saying everything that we know as the word everything in the old testament that is so important to the Jewish people. Remember, when they would write, uh, uh, when they would just simply, there was no copy machines. So that when they would copy from one uh, scroll of, of a book, so they are copying the scroll of Isaiah, for example, and then they're copying it down, and you had these scribes sit down and copy word for word. They would pray. They would go and wash themselves, wash their, in a very like um, a ritualistic way, wash their face, wash their hands. And then they would go and then they would start writing. Then they would get to the word Yahweh or I am or God. And they would stop. They would put their pen down. They would go and wash themselves, clean themselves, and do all the ritual, pray, come back and write out the word Yahweh, I am, or Lord. And they would write it out. And then they would put the pen down and go and wash themselves again and purify themselves and pray and come back and continue with the sentence. So they would do that over and over. There was so much reverence to the word. And here is John saying, all of this that we have honored the Word of God, now the Word is now here in the flesh. He is here, the Creator of the universe. He is here with us. And so go down to verse 14. And the Word, or in Greek, that logos, the, the organizer, the Creator, became flesh. That's important to John. It, it'll, I'll show you why in a moment. The Word became flesh and dwelt or lived among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, when John wrote the Gospel of, of, of John, and also he wrote 1 John, like I said, 2 John and 3 John, those three little letters, he was, he was fighting this, this error, this lie, that had swept through the early church at the time of his writing, and it was called this, Gnosticism. Now, some of you have heard about Gnosticism. I've shared this before with you. A Gnostic, uh, it means to know. That's where we get the word know, Gnostics, knowledge. And they believed that they knew better than everybody else. Kind of sounds like some people today. And, and so they, they, they had this, this idea that um, our, our soul is in this cage called the human body. And the more knowledge you have, the more you know, the more spiritual you are. And that is how our soul will, will disconnect from the human cage 
uh, of this body and get connected with the gods. This, these are Greeks thinking about gods up in the universe, different gods. And so, so they were trying to meditate. They were trying to learn more. They, were, they, they thought the more they, they, the questions they would ask, why are we alive? Those type of questions. And they had philosophy and they would argue with one another. They thought that the more they did that, the more they would connect themselves to, to their gods. And, and then they would do other, other very uh, immoral things, you could just imagine, very immoral things with, with different relationships, different people. And all of that they thought it was simply trying to fight the, the human flesh or, the, or this cage to try to get our souls to somehow go up to the, to the, to the gods up in heaven. And so here comes John and saying, you, you people are crazy, you, you're, you're wrong. Uh, because within that group, there was these Christians. You see, Christianity, there's, it's always been so easy to just kind of manipulate and say, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I still believe these things over here. You know, it still happens today. It's very easy to mix other religions with Christianity. And so, so these so-called Christians were saying, no, Jesus could not have been a man. He could not have been, had a body because then that means he's lesser than a god. And, and so, so, no, he was just a spirit. He was just, he, he was not physically. And so the first heresy, the first lie about Jesus in the early church was not the denial that Jesus was God, but that Jesus was just, that he was never a man. And so that was the first thing they started to say. No, how can God become a man? No, 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 there is no way. Even as a baby, he was just a spirit. He was just like some kind of holy ghost. He is not, he could not have been a human being. So they taught that Jesus, he seemed to have a human body. People saw a human body, but he didn't. And God would not dwell in a human body that, that's too sinful, that's evil and corrupt. So they, they all had these weird sayings that when Jesus walked on the sand, they said, he didn't, he didn't leave footprints because that wasn't, that wasn't actually a body. All sorts of stories that he didn't have a body. So John is writing to fight against that error and will say in 1 John, he would say in the letter that he wrote in 1 John, every spirit does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is an error. If anybody that says that he did not come in the flesh, you're wrong, he's saying. So he's fighting this thing called Gnosticism. Jesus truly was a human. He got tired, he slept, he ate, he wept. The Bible says uh, his spirit was troubled. And all that human emotion and experience at the same time, he's no less God. That's what's miraculous about Jesus. That yes, 100% God, he could still walk on water, but he chose not to because he simply, or at, at the other times, he was simply a man that every one of our temptations, every one of the things that we have been tempted or experienced or felt, he was tempted on. He never sinned though. He simply knew what that means. And so uh, the book of Hebrews says, Jesus is not like a priest that acts so religious that, oh, he's too holy that he does not, that we have nothing to, to talk to him about and he has no compassion over us. No, that Jesus would, when we talk to Jesus, when we pray, we could easily say, Jesus, you know how this felt. Jesus, you know what it means to be a man. You know what it means to, to have these moments of difficulty here on earth as a human being, uh, sadness, depression, even fears. Jesus, you knew how, this, how, how it felt to be a human being. And so that's what John is trying to do throughout the gospel. He's teaching us that Jesus was a man. And so he, he, uh, so he begins setting all this up. He was fully God, fully man. And the second part, towards the end of, the chap of chapter 1, uh, take you down to verse 20, 29. And after the incarnation of the Son of God, so first is the incarnation. God became human. Now it's the presentation of the Son of God. He is presented to John the Baptist, to the disciples who believe in him, to the group of the neighboring towns in, in Cana of Galilee, all the little towns. Uh, John is, is, is talking about how Jesus began to, to uh, go from town to town teaching and doing miracles. And then he also brings up, by chapter 3, he brings up this man named Nicodemus. And then by chapter 4, he brings up this woman we call the Samaritan woman. But look at verse 29 of chapter 1. It says, The next day John, 
Here we go. This is not the same John that's writing this, but John the Baptist. The next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, this is John, the son of Elizabeth, the cousin of Mary. So this is Jesus and John, cousins. And so I don't know if you've ever said this about your cousin, but John the Baptist better had believed that this wasn't just his cousin, just a normal man. This was, he says, uh, he says, behold, or look out, check it out. He says, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So you need to know that John said it. John was from a priestly family. John's father was Zechariah. His father was, was in the priesthood. His father offered up lambs for the morning and evening sacrifice. That's what he did at the temple. He was familiar, John the Baptist was familiar with the shedding of blood for covering sin in the temple, in, in the religious uh, rituals. And here is the son of the priest seeing Jesus, not his cousin, not, not just the son of Mary, but he's seeing Jesus and he's saying, look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So this is he, in, in verse 30, of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he, ha he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And then let's go to chapter 2, verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, chapter 2, verse 23, during, during the feast, many believed in his name when he saw the signs which he did. So, now we read that and we, and we go, that's awesome. That's awesome that many started to believe because of the signs. That's great. The disciples, uh, they're going to get excited. They're going to believe in Jesus. Lord, sign them up. Uh, take them into the prayer room. Uh, get them involved. The disciples, they, 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 they're ready to, to follow. But no, not so fast. It says they believe, but some have called them unsaved believers. How many unsaved believers do we have in church now? There's a lot of people that say they believe, but are they really saved? Now, it's an interesting term. They believed when they saw the healings, obviously. They saw Jesus praying for the blind, and all of a sudden they could see. There's no way that you can't, you can't deny that. So they believed that. They believed when they saw the miracles. They didn't believe in him as a savior. There's, there's a lot of religions right now, uh, uh, for example, Muslims. If you tell them that Jesus is the healer, they believe that. They believe that Jesus is this prophet, that if you somehow pray to him, uh, you will be healed. And they don't have a problem with that. Just don't call him the son of God, much less call him God. And so they have a, they have a big issue with that. But they believe that, yeah, you could pray to him and he'll heal you. And so, so there's a lot of people that come to church and they, they want their miracle, but do they call him savior? Well, not so much. And so they believed him as a healer, and, and that's all they wanted. So notice verse 24. But Jesus did not commit himself to them. So they all believed, but it says that Jesus did not commit themselves, himself to them. Jesus was not ready to commit himself to them. Why? Because he knew all men. He, he knew. So here is, here is John explaining that, yes, he's a man, but he's giving us these hints that Jesus is also fully God. He knew what people were thinking. He knew people's motives. So it seemed like they were ready to commit themselves to him, but Jesus was not ready to commit himself to them. This is an insight in his character. And, and, and it says, and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. So he's explaining that they, he didn't need them just yet, not the way that they wanted to talk about him as simply a miracle worker. Uh, remember, in the book of Acts, there's these moments where um, there's, there's different so-called prophets or, or so-called uh, preachers that were uh, doing some kind of, of, of magical work and, and, and trying to do these, these miracles. And, and then here comes Paul, and he's simply praying for people, and people are getting healed. And remember, there was that one man that he's running after Paul and says, teach me how to do it. I, I, I want to do it your way too. And, and Paul rebukes him because he's saying, no, 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 you're doing it for the wrong reasons. And so Jesus here already, as, as he begins his ministry, he's already getting, uh, they just want things from him. 
I mean, obviously, he's giving uh, multiplying food to, to 5,000. They're, they're thinking, wow, yes, give us more food, Jesus. This is what we want. And he's trying to teach them. It's not about the fishes and the loaves. It's about salvation. It's about eternal life. And, and so right now, there's people that want Jesus. They want, uh, they want whatever thing that we could get from God instead of us submitting ourselves to God. And so uh, now let's go to chapter 3. This is the, the difference between what was happening in chapter 2 with the crowds, with the disciples even, but in chapter 3, there was a man, it says. So Jesus knew men. He knew what was in man. There's some men and some women who believe in him. Jesus won't believe in them. But there is a man different from the other men. There was a man, uh, a Pharisee, so he was an expert in, in the laws of the Old Testament, named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews, very important Jewish man. This man came to Jesus by night. He says that he came at night and he said to him, he said, Rabbi, teacher. So he comes and very respectful. And, and this is so interesting that, that a Pharisee would be so respectful to Jesus. But it says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, he's interested in Jesus, but for a very different reason. They're following the miracle worker. He wants to explore more about who Jesus really was. And so he's not moved by all the miracles as much as they are. And, and, and uh, honestly, this is, this is the, the, the maturity level in which we want to get to when it comes to our relationship with Jesus. Because right now, uh, I could think of a few uh, places right now where there's Christians that have been a Christian for 20, 30 years, and they're at a revival service. And all they want is, is more blessing, more blessing, more blessing. They want to they wanna get more and more and more from God. And, and that's great, but do they know who Jesus is personally? Have they surrendered their life every single day from, uh, to God? Or do they just simply want another spiritual experience? Or do they, just, you know, do they just want the noise and all that? And so here comes Nicodemus and he says, no, I, I want to know who this Jesus is. So he comes to Jesus and again he says, you're a teacher from God. Now, now we need to stop right there. Was, was he accurate? And, and so it's a trick question because, yeah, it's, it's true. He is a teacher. Uh, he's a teacher. He, he was human, though he was God, but he was teaching them. We know that you're a teacher come from God. But here's the misunderstanding of Nicodemus and, and also the others. In the same, it's the same misunderstanding of people have today of who Jesus is. They say, I'm willing to recognize Jesus as a good teacher. And he, he taught a lot of good things, a good person, a good leader, but nothing more. Yeah, he's not the son of God. He's not God. He was a good teacher 2,000 years ago in history. He said a few good things, the, the, the golden rule, treat others as you want to be treated. He, he taught a lot of good things. But he's not the son of God, and he's not God in the flesh. So Nicodemus was, was kind of right, but not fully right. Jesus was a teacher come from God, but more than that, he was God who had come to teach. And so he is God here now on earth teaching us. And verse 3 says, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, for sure, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now this is unique again to the Gospel of John. This interview, this moment, we don't see it in the other Gospels. Here's what I love about Jesus. He doesn't care about flattery. He's not, he doesn't care about Nicodemus coming, oh, oh, teacher sent by God. He just goes straight to the heart. Unless you're born again, you won't even see the kingdom of heaven, he says. Now, I feel kind of sorry for that term, born again, because you say that now, and that means something completely different. Ever since uh, uh, in history, President Jimmy Carter said that, that he was born again Christian, it kind of ruined it, because, I mean, that's great, that's, that's good he said it, uh, but... There was a time in our country when, when born again meant what we know as biblical Christians what it means. It means to be born again Christian, to have a new creation, to be a brand new man and woman of God. And, but when the president of the United States said it, born again, nothing wrong with that, but it became part of our pop culture. And right now it's just a, just a pop culture term. People now talk about reincarnation. 
as being born again. Uh, there's all sorts of weird experiences of being born again. Uh, there's songs about being born again. Uh, and so, so it kind of cheapens the term, being born again. But the words that Jesus tells Nicodemus, he says, you need to be born again, is literally translated, born from the top, or born from above. So you want to get to heaven? He's saying, you, you got to be born from the top. You, you've got to be born from above. There needs to be not just a, a physical birth, one time, we all had that physical birth, but a spiritual birth. You have, to, you have to be completely a brand new person, and that birth is coming from up top. It's coming from God himself. And then he fully explains it in chapter 3, verse 16 now. The most famous verse in all of Scripture. Martin Luther, uh, the, the, the Catholic priest turned Protestant, Martin Luther called the Bible in miniature. The whole Bible is there in John 3.16. It covers the entire uh, understanding of salvation. So let's go there quickly. John 3.16, again, he tells them, you've got to be born again for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let me just go, go quickly there. This is the, the, the whole origin of salvation. This is all uh, that, that it says, for God so loved the world. You know, sometimes people say, I'm searching for God, or, or you know, I'm searching for God. Really, where are you looking? Where, where are you looking for God? Is it at the mosque? Is it at the church, at the cathedral, uh, at, at a group, at a different religion? Uh, first of all, God isn't lost. You're lost. God has been searching for you for a long time. The, the origin of this experience is not you. It's God. He is the one searching for us. So for God so loved the world, the Bible says in Ephesians 2, we were dead in sin. Dead people don't search for anything. We can't do it ourselves. He's the one that's searching for us. So, so the origin of salvation, it's, it's for God. Second, the motivation of salvation. For God so loved the world. I hope you're still in, in awe of the fact that, that he loves you. I hope that never becomes uh, just a routine or just a thing that you just kind of brush off. Yeah, yeah, God loves me. No, God, the creator of the universe, he loves us. For God so loved, that's the greatest miracle. You know, John wrote this, wrote in 1 John, it goes, here is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. That's real love. So you have the origin and the motivation of salvation. So, and, and third, the destination of salvation. For God so loved the world. All of us. Now, to a Jew, a Jewish leader like Nicodemus, a Pharisee who believed that God loved special people, chosen people, the elect people, only the Jews. And, and to be told that God so loved the world. That was a wake-up call. That, that was a new, some new information for Nicodemus. They literally believe this. And, and many Jewish people right now believe the same thing. How dare some American Christian believe that God loves them? No, we are, we're Jewish. We are descendants of Abraham. God loves us and that's it. Salvation is for us only. So, so love, he not only loves us, but love is not silent. Can, love can never be passive. Love, love must be active and must always be giving. So God demonstrated his love. Next, we have the condition of salvation. Whoever believes in him, it's just by belief. You have to believe in him. You have to believe the gospel, the good news. If you believe truly, you have faith that God sent his son into this world to die on a cross, to pay for our sins, that he rose again from the dead, that he is alive today. If you actually believe that, and by believe, I mean you believe it as your own. You surrender to the knowledge, the fact, the truth, that it changes you, that you are saved. That's the gospel, whoever believes in him. If you get anybody else that tells you, well, well, yeah, you got to believe in Jesus, but you, but you also have to do this, this, and this, and this. You also have to stop doing all of this, and, and you also have to uh, 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 stop going to church on a Sunday. you got to go to church on a Saturday. All these other things that you get, that people keep adding more and more to, to Christianity. True Christianity says, God loved you, do you love him back? Do you receive salvation? Yes. Okay, here it is. You are saved. It is a free gift of grace. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay, so John is also the only one 
to record this beautiful moment in chapter 4 of the woman at the well of Samaria. And I just want, at the well, and I just want you to notice one, one verse. It's in verse 4. So John 4.4. 4. It says, but he needed to go through Samaria. And I love, that's one of the most, if you have a Bible with you, if it's yours, circle it, underline it. He needed to go through Samaria. It's literally, it's like literally saying he, Jesus needed to get to your home, needed to get to Stockton, needed to get to your house, needed to get to your heart. He needed to go through Samaria. If you and I were Jewish, living 2,000 years ago, and heard somebody say, hey, Jesus needs to go through Samaria, you would go, you would say, no, he doesn't. He doesn't have to go through Samaria. There's other routes. There's other ways. There was literally two other ways to get from Galilee to Jerusalem. And they would travel and they would literally want to go all the way around instead of having to go through Samaria. But the Jewish people, they, they, there was this moment where the Jewish people started to intermarry other, other cultures and other, other non-Jewish people and those became Samaritans. And so the true Jewish people from the south, they thought, no, we don't want anything to do with them, and we don't even want to step in the same, in the same dirt as they, that they step on. And so, but Jesus, it says, he needed to get to Samaria. So why? Because there was a woman who really needed life change, who really needed forgiveness. Jesus isn't just about the crowds, he's about that one. And that's what John is trying to get us to understand. He cares about that one individual. He needed to get to her. He got a hold of her. She went and told the other people at her village. She was, we could say, the first missionary, the first evangelist, uh, that she started to share about Jesus, this man that came and told me all the things I've done. And he says that, that he is the living water and, and that, he, that, that I will never have to thirst again. And so she went and shared about him and others started believing in Jesus. And in chapter 5, here's the only writer, John, to bring the story out of verse 1. After this was a feast of the Jews. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. There was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. So this is the story. I kind of brought it up on Sunday, where there's these people waiting for this water to bub bubble up. They thought it was an angel that bubbled, bubbled up the water. Jesus shows up. And Jesus tells this paralyzed man, do you want to be healed? He says, yes. He says, well, then get up and walk. And so once again, Jesus, uh, John is showing the power that Jesus has, not only to do a miracle, but he has power over nature itself. He's more powerful than the water. He's more powerful than the sickness. He could be your healer. And so uh, uh, that's why John includes Jesus walking on water that it's basically, he created it, he's saying. He is, he is God who created the water. He could walk on it if he wants to. So I, 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 want, us, I want us to just to, to jump down to, let's see, we're going to go down to chapter, or chapter 7. So go to chapter 7, after Jesus heals this man, after the confrontation takes place in the temple with the leaders, so they start, they start arguing with Jesus. They're saying, how can you heal a man on a Sabbath day? And, and they get all religious with Jesus and telling him, you're not supposed to do it that way. After these things, there in verse 1, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to go back into Judea. So he's back north. He's done with the south now because the Jews wanted to kill him. I'm going to take you all the way back to verse 37. It says, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So, there was these three feasts that would happen. Celebrations, holidays to us. And one of them was the Feast of Tabernacles. It was a celebration of how God took care of the people outside in tents, outside in the desert, in the wilderness. And so they had this great celebration. There was these pilgrims. They, they would leave their, their towns to go to Jerusalem. Uh, this great holiday, this celebration lasted eight days. So every day there was a ritual. The priest would leave the temple and he would go down the hill to this pool called the Pool of Siloam. And there he would take the water, 
he would get, get water and take it home. And so you would go down to the pool. He would bring a pitcher, a silver pitcher, walk back up to the tabernacle, to the temple, and, and pour it at the base of the altar. And he would pour it down there at the altar. And, and it, was, it, was, it was symbolic of how that water would, would purify the, the presence of God. And then the priest would yell out a quote from Isaiah chapter 12. And he said, with joy you will draw water from the well of salvation. So they did that every day for those eight days. Every morning, every day, every morning. On the last day of the feast, the priest went down twice and did it. And it was a bigger crowd on the last day. There was more people there. And so the water would be poured out every day. He would shout, with joy you bring water from the well of salvation. Then it said, and probably right after this event, that Jesus, so the priest is over there with the water, and Jesus, he cried out in the temple. So Jesus is over at the temple, and he didn't say softly, he didn't say, okay, so there's, can, can we do it? No, he says, he shouted, he cried out, there's thousands of people, he has to get their attention, and he's yelling, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. So he, so the priest is over there, and he's trying to get everybody's attention because that's his moment, as the, the religious moment. But at that moment, he says that. He's quoting Isaiah, never be thirsty. But Jesus is shouting, if anyone is thirsty, come to me and drink. So everyone's head turns around. And they hear him say this. If you're thirsty, you're quoting Isaiah, he's saying. You're remembering that our forefathers were given water out of the rock in the Old Testament. And God brought water for the people of Israel in the wilderness to quench their thirst. Let me just tell you, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink, he's saying. So this is a, a huge statement that that day would, would have been because whoever believes in me uh, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And so he's saying, it's not just that he's going to quench your thirst. He's saying, you're going to overflow with so much water, so much life in you that you're going to give water to others. And so that's what he wants for, from us. Not just to be quenched and, oh, I feel good and comfortable now. I have life. No, he gives us life. He gives us water so that we could give others to drink. So now in chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, this is now Jesus preparing his disciples for his death. And he starts giving them all of these, these different teachings and preparing them. And so chapter 13 is so important in verse 1. That's the Passover meal. That's the meal where, where we would call it now communion. And he's, he's preparing them. And so there's no crowds there. All the crowds are gone. Now it, it's, 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 it's going from huge crowds to now 12. And then John is focusing now just on Jesus at the end of the gospel. And so he's, he's there having, uh, having this supper with them. And, and right when it ends knowing that the Father had given him all things in his hands, that he had come from God, was going to God. He rose from the, from the supper. He laid aside his garments. It says he took off his garments, took a towel and, and put it around his waist, girded himself, and, and that poured water into a basin. He began to wash the disciples' feet, to wipe them with the towel which, which he was girded. And so that act was sort of a parable. It's kind of like symbolically everything that was happening that Jesus did himself. So look at, look at it this way. Jesus rose up from the table like he got up from the throne of God, the, the, the throne of heaven. It says that he took off his garments. He took off his, his robes, his, 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 uh, his clothes. And Philippians chapter 2 tells us that he emptied himself of being God. Then third, he took a towel and girded himself, Jesus wrapped himself in a skin of humanity, a cloak of humanity, while on the earth, he put this, this he put uh, human flesh on himself, then he poured water into a basin to wash his, his disciples' feet, and in a few hours he would be arrested, and he would pour out his blood upon a cross to wash people from their sin. And in chapter 17, that's where we see the longest prayer that I mentioned, it's not that he didn't pray other prayers, but this is the one that's, that we have recorded here. And he simply prays for his disciples. And when you have time, read chapter 17 of, of, of John. It is, it is a prayer, Jesus, not only for his disciples, but he says all the other believers, including us. And so he's praying for you and I, and, and it's there. So, so it's awesome to read. What prayer does God pray for us? It's there in John 17. 
And so let's go down now. We're going to go down. I'll take you now to verse to chapter 19, verse 1. We'll fast forward to his arrest. Pilate took Jesus. He scourged him. We call the scourging. That's using the Roman uh, whip. The soldiers twisted a, a crown of thorns, put it on his head, put him in, in uh, a purple robe, and they said, Hail the king of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. And verse 25, there stood by the cross Jesus, a cross of Jesus, his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the, the wife of, of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So there's Mary, the mother of Jesus, there's Mary, the wife of Clopas, and then there's Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and his disciple whom he loved, there's, that's John, standing there, says John, he said, that, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. He said to his disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her home and he took care of her. Now, John, it seems, the only disciple at the cross, he's the only one still there, again, maybe, probably, because he was the youngest. And so he's, he's there with Jesus' family. And, and so one of the reasons why Jesus even said, I want you to take care of my mother. I love that, that Jesus, still being man, he's on the cross, he's dying for our sins, he's suffering, and he's still taking care of family business. He's still saying, John, I want you to take care of my mom as soon as I die. Because by this time, Joseph, the husband of Mary, no doubt, he was already dead by this time. Um, and, and so tradition says that he was already dead. Jesus gives Mary to the charge of John. And so after this moment, we never hear about Mary again. There's no more, no more teaching about Mary. There's, 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 there's been other traditions that say that Mary then went off to other cities and became a preacher and stuff, but the Bible doesn't say any of that. Uh, we see her just for a moment in the book of Acts. They're there, probably her house, praying and worshiping. And then, and then uh, chapter 1 and 2 of Acts happen. Uh, but now we come to the last section. We're going to go very quickly here. I'm going to take you to the very end. And this is the resurrection of the Son of God. And, and Peter and John both go to the tomb. They start running. And, and John records that they both went to the tomb. But John also tells us that John beat Peter to the tomb. He wants us to know that. He wants you to know that on resurrection day, for the resurrection marathon, John won. Peter came in second. John, he, he makes sure that everyone that's reading this knows that he says the one he loved got there first. <laughs> so he beat Peter. But he also wants you to know that when he looked into the tomb, Peter was just, he kind of looked confused. He didn't know what was happening. But John looked into the tomb and he believed and that he had, he had risen from the dead. And, and, bring, and John brings all that out too. And so uh, he closes in chapter 21 with Jesus in Gal Galilee with his disciples. Peter goes back to fishing because that's all that Peter knew to do. He said, well, I guess this is over. Jesus is dead or they stole his body. Let's just get back to fishing. Uh, we got to go back to working. And so the others just simply joined him. And so chapter 21, verse 4, when the morning had come now, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They said, no. He said to them, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you find, and you, and you will find some. And then that sounds very familiar. So they cast and now they're able to draw it in because the multitude, they couldn't even pull it up because there was so much multitude of fish. And so the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. That's Jesus. He wants you to know that he was the first one to spot Jesus. So again, uh, a humble John, uh, the writer of this gospel. And so let's go to the very last verse. And there are so many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. Now, the last verse could be a figure of speech or could be literally the, the truth. And it's, and it's so right. It's there. It's, it's not just an exaggeration. If you actually think of the millions of people throughout history whose lives have been changed by Jesus, including ours, if they were to write about those, those changes, a book about our life, you would have huge libraries. There wouldn't be enough libraries in the world to contain them. That's what John is saying at the end of this book. There are millions of names written in the Lamb Book of Life, and I hope yours is also. And so right now, if you're watching, if, if you're there, make sure that 
you are part of that Lamb Book of Life. And make sure you know Jesus. Not just as a miracle worker, not just as a religious figure, not just as a teacher or someone that wrote things in the past or said, said a lot of good sayings, but make sure that you get to know Him as your God, as your Savior, as your Lord. So let's pray. Father, as, as, you, as we close tonight, we close in prayer, God. But you've changed so many lives and you changed even this man, this, this, this disciple of yours who became your sent one, your, your apostle. You changed John's life. His writings, God, committed to this fourth gospel has changed my life, our lives, all of ours, God. Thank you, Lord, that you are still in the business of transforming lives. That you still, like you had to go to Samaria, you had to come to us because you loved us. I thank you, Lord, that John 3.16 is still as powerful now as it was then. That you loved us so, that you loved the world, that there is no one less in your eyes, that you died for all of us. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we who are born again, we surrender ourselves to your plan. Just like you, just like you went and reinstated Peter after he denied you three times and you simply said, Peter, feed my sheep. And Lord, you used him in a great way because you were merciful. I pray, God, that you use us even though we have disobeyed you, even though we have lived selfishly in the past. I pray, my God, that you simply forgive us and you give us new life, that we are born again, that we can live a new life with new purpose. I pray, God, that as we continue understanding the New Testament, your, the words that you want for us to know, I pray, God, that you become more and more real, that you're not just a, 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 a spiritual being, that you're not just simply this, this the goosebumps that we get, Lord, uh, in a spiritual experience, in a, in, a, in a tent revival or at an altar service, but, God, that you are the creator of the universe and that you want to have complete control of our life. From the moment we wake up to the moment we sleep, and I thank you that you don't even sleep, that you're there with us, protecting us, taking care of us, and Lord, continue to speak to us and guide us and mold us to how you want us to be. We thank you for your word. May you continue to bless it and bless us the rest of this week. We love you, God, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Well, may God bless you. Have a good night. Hopefully.